It seems like every day there's an executive comp story. And you were asked on the Hill about your executive pay ratio and what employees should think about it. And you basically said, I would hope that it's aspirational to our rank and file. Did that answer resonate when you got back home? I, I hope so, because my answer is I am that person. I started at our firm in 1983 at $17,000 a year. And I, you know, through the grace of God, through work, hard work, got to where I am. So I am that person that looked up and said, maybe if I work hard enough, I can get there. But if the ratio is what it is, what is the, what's the upside limit? There must be a ceiling somewhere before it gets absurd. Well, I, I think in there, the, 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 numbers, the numbers are challenged themselves, Carl, because they're not apples to apple. We run, we've got 200,000 people, many of them outside the United States. You have 40,000 people in Mexico. I've got people in the Philippines. I've got people, and so to compare city against a, a, a U.S. company, our average employee in the United States makes right at about $100,000 a year. Let me ask you about something that happened yesterday. You're a traditional banker in 1983, been around. Uh, did you ever think that you would have a, this kind of silly site called Twitter? And the president would urge the Fed chief to cut rates down to one, and it would be taken seriously? I would say today, in those 36 years, Jim, I would say more and more, nothing surprises me. <laughs> All right. And I want to speak to something personally that, that you did. Uh, a little more than a year ago, you set restrictions on firearms by business customers. Has it hurt business? Has it helped? Has it mattered? And why'd you do it? I think. As expected, when we, when we put out our policy, and it was put out in the form of a policy, we got reactions on both sides. There were, were, there were those that applauded and felt that it was a great move. And again, you just look at yesterday, North Carolina, closing day of school. We've got to do something about it. And there were those who were, who were adamantly against it, believing that business shouldn't be taking Second Amendment stances. Ours wasn't a Second Amendment stance. It was simply around what we believed was a, a push around some best practices that might help a, a challenge. Well, but you've got so many of these hair trigger policy decisions. Uh, for example, sponsoring an event with the president of Brazil and knowing what he has said about LGBT. I mean, yeah. how, do you, how do you balance all of those things? You know you're going to get blowback. I think most importantly, we, we spend a lot of time making sure our people understand the values of our company. And I hope in the case of that, there's no question in terms of our support, our unwavering support for our LGBT community. And, you know, in there, we're supporting the Brazilian Chamber of Commerce. We've operated in Brazil for, for many, many decades. And, um, you know, I think we're very clear in terms of our stance. And, but we've spent a lot of time, Carl, making sure that we're communicating those messages and that we're clear with our people. Did uh, anyone follow? This, I'm sorry. Sorry. Earlier this week, I uh, sat down with David Solomon, CEO of Goldman Sachs. You know, we talked a lot about the changes at that institution that seem to be, or not seem to be, are much more focused on the consumer, on building a mass affluent brand and a platform to service them. More potentially of competition for some of your franchises. Mm -hmm. Do you see that as a potential competitor in the future? Do you think that they have an opportunity to succeed at Goldman? I, you know, again, I think that the, that the, the strategy is one that I've read about is, you know, is a bit of a niche strategy in terms of the wealthy or ultra wealthy trying to, to kind of cater and get deposits. Consumer and, loans, consumer deposits. I mean, yeah. it's, it's and, you know, it's not your typical investment banking strategy. And, and, but I would also describe that it's not necessarily your typical run of the mill high street, main street consumer bank either. Right. And so from our perspective, we think we've got the ability to combine the best of both, of having the physical presence and being able to provide that experience and at the same time investing heavily into technology. And if you looked at what we talked about on our first quarter earnings call was de novo around some experimenting we're doing. We grew a billion dollars of consumer deposits online just kind of experimenting in some new ways of attracting new customers to the bank.